I'm so happy to introduce the next guest, Jesse Tissell, who is a professor at York University and the author of the national best-selling book and making an international splash. The book is called From the Ashes, and it's winning so many awards. This book keeps getting uh, accolades and is popping up in so many social media platforms because people are enjoying the writing and understanding the struggle of Jesse Tissell and his life story. From the Ashes is a memoir of love, struggle, addiction, and shows how an individual is connected with his society and family as he wrestles with his identity as a young indigenous male in Canada. It is so beautifully written. And it's like sitting at a campfire and listening to someone share their intimate life with you. It's a very hard book to put down. In this interview, we cover how he wrote this incredible book, how he overcame his struggles with addiction to drugs and alcohol, and became an award-winning professor despite his learning setbacks. By the way, he won the Governor General's Academic Medal in 2016, and is a Pierre Elliott Trudeau Foundation Scholar and a Vanier Scholar. In this interview, he shares his process of what he went through in rehab and how he had to learn about self-care and self-love. He shares how he manages life after falling from a three and a half story building and the after effects of that. He shares his perspectives about grief, loss, addiction and his family. We talk about residential schooling, homelessness, trauma, and how we can change things as we move forward. We talk about empathy and how that's related currently in the field of medic medicine and the kind of attitude that doctors and nurses have. He's very candid as he shares his opinion of doctors and so much more. I, I'm sure you're going to enjoy the little back and forth conversation we had at that part of the interview. We cover so much ground in this interview, and there's a surprise at the end of the interview. Uh, I think you'll enjoy it, so you'll want to listen to the whole interview at the end. Uh, I hope you enjoy my conversation with the resilient and talented Jesse Thistle. Jesse, uh, welcome to the show, and thank you so much for joining me today to talk about your book. Um, well, it's an honor to be here, Doctor. Thank you. Please call me Lalit. Uh, if that's too hard, you can call me doctor. <laughs> so <laughs> Lalit, I'll call you Lalit. Oh, you got it. Perfect. Perfect. Um, you know, your book is so beautifully written and it's so eloquent. Uh, you're very vulnerable, raw, and um, it, it, I really enjoyed reading it. So very visceral. I certainly want to talk about your life, your um, Teaching as teachings as an academic, um, your experience as in as a you know when you were homeless and and some of the journey, but I would like to start off by reading a passage in the book because for any of our listeners who haven't um, who haven't read the book, I just wanted to people to get a taste of how wonderful it is. So here we go. At 7.30 a.m. the next day, Uncle Ron pulled back into the driveway. I was still staring out the window after downing pot after pot of coffee and smoking cigarette after cigarette. My teeth buzzed like I'd eaten a hive of bees. Uncle Ron slummed over the steering wheel. The car was still running, but the car stereo was off. He, was always, he always drove with 70s rock blaring. He finally got out of the car and made his way to the house. I heard the grind of gravel with each step. I poured a cup of coffee and left it on the table. The floorboards creaked as he found his way upstairs and sat down. It appeared he'd been crying, which is odd to me since he was so powerful, so full of male bravado. I didn't know he could cry. I was afraid to ask what had happened and went back into the sunroom to my chair by the window. A stand of trees caught my eye, the tops of the birch, birch branches dancing in the wind. The sun tangled up in the, 
in their rusty leaves. The clink of Uncle Ron's spoon against the side of his mug sounded out like a chorus of sledgehammers striking like railway ties. He cleared his throat and asked me to join him. I don't know how to say this, he said, not looking at me. Another oddity. I pulled up a chair to the table, as silent as I could be. You know, the, it's so visceral. I, I could hear the, him walking to the car. That's what just made, makes your book so wonderful as, we're, as, you're, as I was reading it. Um, I wanted to start off by asking you, why do you think men have trouble expressing emotions? I mean, and uh, you, you had mentioned in the book your grandfather was had his own style of, of expressing love, and I think that's a fairly common uh, scenario. I wanted to get your thoughts on that. Well, I just think that we're raised not to... Uh, more emphasis is placed on like, um, you know, actionable things, you know, possessions, uh, expressing our, our anger or our aggression. That's, it's privileged to, it, you know, we're rewarded for this, you know, it's a capitalist, uh, mentality out there. And if you have that killer instinct and that's what you need. You know, and men or boys that try to express their feelings or emotions, they're shut down. And this happens early in our education, you know, and it's uh, it's to the detriment to the health of men, ultimately, because we're given these emotions for a reason uh, and we're supposed to express them. So to have half of our emotions suppressed and another half rewarded. Uh, creates an imbalance in uh, men and families. How did you find, you said the book is a love, it's a story about love. Can you expand on that? Yeah, yeah, it is. The story, it's, uh, it's a story of love. And so the highest love for me as an Indigenous person is community love, is the love of land is the love of my culture and my people. And so early in the book, you see that I'm with my uh, cookum on the land. I'm speaking my language. I'm picking berries. She's teaching me how to be a good relative, uh, to, to live in what we call Wakuduin. So all of our relations in creation. And that abruptly stopped when I was very young. I was three and a half years old when I lost my parents and I was... I ended up in a strange new world in Brampton, Ontario, and I didn't know where the love that I knew was. I didn't know where my Cookham and Musham were. I didn't know where my mom, my mom and dad were. And I'm all of a sudden in this new land where I'm disconnected from all that love. And so I spend the rest of my life literally trying to understand and be loved and let love into my life and it doesn't happen until years after I go through all kinds of stuff on the streets and with addiction and through the justice system that I finally come to know the love of creator, the love of community and my wife. There were so many elements I'm sure in your life that you could have chosen. Uh, how did you choose the, the elements to when you were writing your book? What do you mean by elements? Well, I mean, different aspects, different stories. How did you recall, you know, this person, that event? Um, how did you? Oh, how did I choose? Yeah. How did you figure that process out? Uh, a lot of it had to do with I had done my AA steps. So I'm a practitioner of uh, the 12 step program. That's how I got sober at this Christian rehab. And so part of my program was to figure out my addiction by writing them down and really trying to understand what happened in my addiction through story, right, narration. And so I'd been collecting these all along when I got out of rehab and I had them and 
Uh, when I was offered the book contract, I sent them all to Simon & Schuster and they went through with me to pick out the ones that would appear in the book because there are a lot more. They just didn't make it all into the book. And so <clears throat> I only picked what was needed to give the reader the idea of the tone of the kind of life that I was living, right? Because if I was to really like write about life that way, 12 years on and off the streets, it'd be volumes of books, right? Mm -hmm. It wouldn't just be one. And so we had to be very selective in the stories that we talked about uh, so that we, we weren't overlapping with other ones. And so we weren't alienating our reader because there's so much stuff that I went through that is just so far outside the realm of normal for other people that to put them all in there, sure, they're dramatic, but it ultimately would alienate the reader. So we had to make conscious decisions on which ones to include. Well, there was a lot of humor in th through the book. Uh, I mean, there was obviously also a lot of uh, hardship, uh, severe hardship, but the humor was really evident. Uh, so that was, I think that's what also made the book very enjoyable. Um, from the moment you decided to put the book together, how, how do you have a rough idea how long it took? Because writing is certainly not easy. I mean, most people say they'd write a book, but very few people actually complete it. Yeah, no, I, uh, yeah, humor was a big central part of it, right? Uh, writing and, um, I always tried to, even in the most ridiculous of situations in the book, try to lighten it up with a little humor because, I, again, it could just turn people off if it's not interesting. So, And then the second part of what you were saying there, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know uh, what to say to that, really. Um, was it months or did it take a year, two years or to, to... Uh, no, I, I entered the, well, I, I saw Sheila Rogers in August of 2017, we had breakfast and then that was in the middle of August. And then by the end of November of that year, I had the book written. So it took me three months, it took me three months. Wow. The book has now been on been number one twice as long as it took to write the actual thing. It only took me three months and it's been on now a year. It's, you know, that's four times longer than it took to write the book. It's been on the charts. So, yeah. Well, I don't know. It just came out of me. Yeah. What was the, did you have a particular time you wrote? Did you have a process? Yeah, I would get up early in the morning at like 430 I'd go down and make myself, we have one of those, uh, it's uh, like a, an espresso maker, or the Italian ones that you put on the stove. I make my, like a big thing of espresso, huge thing of coffee, and then go into my room for about three or four hours and write until I start to edit. Once I start editing, then I know I'm not fresh anymore mm -hmm. and that the ideas aren't just flowing through me anymore. So I just walk away. Because that's you, me trying to force a story. You know? Were you were you more of a typer, or or did you use pen and paper? Did you have a method that? Oh no, I did, I did do everything on a computer. I did everything on like an old Dell that okay. I bought with money that I got for school, and so nothing special. The regular old PC. Yeah. Nice. A question you I'm sure you've been asked many times, but why did you write? your memoir because I mean yeah I was just asked I was asked to write the memoir I'm a I'm a scholar that's the way I see myself and I won a bunch of awards back in 2016 that caught media attention mm -hmm. and they came to do a story on me with the Toronto Star and the guy asked how I got to school and I told him basically I robbed a store that's how I got to school. That was how I started. And he was like, what? Like, that's not normal. And so I told him my life story and he put the story out in the Toronto Star. And then I got called. Um, I got called from Simon and Schuster 
and they offered me a major book contract and that's how the book became so i'm an accidental author usually authors have to write a manuscript and shop it around or go to auction or all these things i didn't do any of that it just kind of happened so yeah. uh, that's quite a story it's uh it, um i i want to turn to a part in your life where you made the change from in in the rehabilitation process when uh, and you talk about how you actually went into your new uh, advent, new academic uh, goals, I guess. You called it micro goals. So, I mean, on page 313, you, you wrote, if I can make it to the next minute, I thought then I might have a chance to be something more than a struggling crackhead. So do you have any advice for someone who is struggling with, you know, and it was making a change because they may think, you know, well, Jesse, yeah, you're maybe one in a million, but uh, I could never do that. Yeah. So I was given a teaching years ago about choice. And the teaching goes, I won't go through the reveal. I'll just tell you the lesson. The teaching is that when you know that you have choice, you can just choose to do whatever you want and all the things that you tell yourself as to why you made that choice are just justifications your mind are making up to justify your choice so ultimately making a choice is as simple as i'm going to choose this bottle and have a drink all of life is like that every single bit and so you need to know that you need to know that you have agency and that you have choice the second half of that is life changes through repetition and habit you have to also understand that and that habits don't start through grand gestures they're not like i'm gonna run a marathon every three days no set something that's measurable in time that's small and repeatable and just do that with consistency over and over until it becomes habit. When it becomes habit, then you're ready for another change, another choice. And you just continue to do that. And the way I like to describe it is like real change, the real monumental change happens incrementally, like uh, in a cave, a stalactite at the bottom, growing, 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 growing into like a pillar of calcium that started with one little drop over time with inconsistency and so it's like that with anything that you do if you want to be the most uh decorated undergrad student then you chart out your time you manage it well and you consistently show up and do that thing that gets you on top whether that be studying you know, learning new things, handing your stuff in on time. All these are habits, right? And so you just keep doing that over time. And eventually it'll add up to a doctor's degree or a PhD in history or, you know, a marathon. But it all starts as a mustard seed. It's It all starts as a small choice that you make over and over and over and over again. Yes. Uh, well said. When you were in rehab, can you talk about you know the etiquette course that you took? It was by I think Dr. Jennifer uh, Lennox Terrian. Lennox Terrian. She was a professor in Ottawa, right? And yeah, uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, uh, sure. Sure. Yeah. So uh, I was in a program called Harvest House. It's a Christian rehab. And they're like the only place that would take me <laughs> this place like so it was a little culty a little culty this place you know a little christiany and uh they had this partnership with the university of ottawa to take guys and train them uh in etiquette and communication and how to like you know take care of themselves and so when i started this program with dr tarian 
uh, I'd been sober for maybe two months or something. And I had never really finished anything in my life. I didn't have education, could barely read properly. And most importantly, there had been an erosion in my uh, like hygiene and my own etiquette because I'd been homeless and uh, in and out of the justice system and just in between places for so long, you start to lose those skills. These are skills that we learn as kids, you know, our, our parents teach us. And then we just practice them throughout our life and they, they seem like second nature. Well, if you, you haven't done them for a long ass time, and then it starts to get hard to, you know, press your clothes, make your bed, shave, take care of yourself. All these things are learned. And so when I got into that class, I confided in um, my peers and her, like, I need help. I can't do any of this anymore. And I'm really rough around the edges. And they, she, she, took, she, she and her students really took the time to uh, help me along. And I graduated. I did well with those modules. And I got this little piece of paper uh, that said that I graduated. And to me, that's like one of the greatest things I ever did. It was the first time my name ever appeared on anything that said university. And it, like, it just made me dream. It made me dream in the most beautiful way. And so that's what that is in the story of that certificate and what those modules meant. Mm -hmm. That, um, I think that's such an important step is making part of those micro changes is how you self care, self love, uh, as mm. you also talk about in your book. So, um, yeah, I want to shift uh, gears a little bit and talk about uh, the whole issue of homelessness. You're a professor at York University, you have a lot of knowledge about this. Um, in Canada, indigenous population, uh, eight times more likely to be homeless and um, that problem is uh, that is is growing you know um, what are some things we can do in the healthcare profession and in society or as, as individuals uh, to change that well I would say first I think that any physician should read um, the definition of indigenous homelessness that I crafted when I was at the COH, that's the Canadian Observatory on Homelessness. But it articulates that indigenous homelessness is different as unique drivers uh, that are separated from Canadian homelessness, uh, which is really about a structure of habit, not having a structure of habitation to live with or live in. So my uh, I would ask to start there so that physicians understand that indigenous homelessness is really about a disconnection from healthy relationships over time due to colonial interruption because of the way that the state was formed and operates. So indigenous people lost their land, not once, not twice, multiple times over through historic displacement and contemporary displacement with things like wet sweatin', or muskrat falls or anywhere where the land is like adulterated uh, by settlers that that creates homelessness there's been a disconnection from language from spirituality from our domiciles and our architecture of home that's been um that's a kind of homelessness that indigenous people endure that's unique you know in residential schools day schools they were all designed to take away that culture, you know, uh, to go with that, there is a, a, a epistemological, uh, I forget, there's one, uh, Dr. Alex Wilson has a really specific names for it. So the loss of worldviews that happened. So indigenous people saw them as can, themselves as within the natural world, uh, with their kinship structures as a kin member. And so that was changed or conditioned out of indigenous people through the Christianization and doctrinization process. So we've lost even the way that we think uh, in pre-colonial times. And so all these factors lead to houselessness in the field, in emergency, in walk-in, in clinics, all, in all these places where doctors come in contact with them. So 
I would ask doctors whether they're even aware of uh, the definition or the history uh, of the people that they're uh, studying or working with or treating. And so that's square one. And then beyond that, when they start to really understand that, I would say that they should read my work with Dr. Janet Smiley around um, creating relatives with Indigenous homeless people within uh, clinical settings and how that can be done through an Indigenous worldview and lens. So we did we studied this in um, Manitoba, uh, in Winnipeg and uh, Saskatoon, and we found that there were four protocols of indigenous ways of interacting that we should be bringing into the medical establishment to change and hopefully uh, prevent the loss of indigenous homeless lives. And uh, that's online. It's easily searchable. Okay. I'll, I'll put a link in the show notes for that. So it's easily mm. accessible. That would be really uh, helpful. One of the things I actually am surprised is how many people don't know don't know about the Canadian history of residential schooling. Um, right. Could you maybe just explain for the listeners? Uh, maybe we could just talk about that briefly. What that sure. Actually so hap- what actually happened? What happened? Okay. So uh, there was always um, within colonization, especially after the War of eighteen twelve, in Canada. Native people were started were stopped being seen as allies, military, and like social allies, and we were start to being seen as a social problem, right? And so there were efforts then to try and uh, what's called assimilate, so make uh, indigenous people part of the settler state body body politic. Uh, and they did this by renouncing their connection to land and their family. Uh, that was like the very earliest iteration of that. And uh, starting in like the 1840s and 50s, uh, people thought that, hey, maybe we should educate the native out of indigenous people so that they would have a quicker route into what's called civilization. The civilizations attached to like notions of social Darwinism where... You know, colonizers back in the day used to think that they were superior. They were the most civilized people. Uh, and, and so um, Egerton Ryerson, I believe, proposed uh, to have um, these residential schools where indigenous people could send their children. And some of them started here. I think Mohawk Institute it started in like 1830 or 40 in, uh, that's near Bradford, near the Six Nations Reserve. And so it was always there. So when Canada formed in 1867 and started forming treaties with indigenous peoples out West, part of the First Nations signing those treaties to rent their land basically to Canada, let Canadians use them, use their land, Uh, was that Canada had a responsibility to educate Indigenous kids. And uh, this was supposed to be something that was done on reserve, uh, you know, with uh, the family of the kids around. That was what was agreed upon in Treaties 1 through 9, I believe. And so when Canada formed and they got the upper hand, uh, they just turned away from that uh, responsibility and they realized that they couldn't afford really to educate all these indigenous kids. And so they came up with the idea off of the Dawes Act in the States uh, to have these large industrial schools uh, where they could re-educate native kids and create Canadian citizens out of them where they'd be wage earners for the emerging economy in the West. That was the original intention of them. Now, the second half of that is part of uh, transforming Indigenous peoples into tax-paying Canadian citizens was to get them off of the land. They wanted to separate Indigenous uh, folks from the land so that they could actually take the land and they wouldn't have to fulfill treaty, uh, treaty obligations like paying stipends and 
uh, resources and education and healthcare to indigenous peoples. So the government's solution was to offload the cost of education, these large industrial schools, to Anglican, Catholic, Presbyterian, um, Moravian, all these different types of um, orders, uh, Christian orders, to educate these natives, right? Because it was cheaper for them to do that. And so within this, you had a, de a recipe for disaster. Uh, the Canadian government started building schools far away from reserves because initially the kids would just run back and go back home. And so they said to solve this problem, we should put them hundreds of kilometers away from <coughs> home uh, reserves or where the kids are taken. And then once they get to these schools, then we're going to take away their language, their their sense of self as indigenous, uh, all their cultural practices, and we're going to replace it with, um, you know, uh, English, a Judeo-Christian worldview, uh, you know, arithmetic, English, anything that like kids now learn. And so that was early on, it was like this. And these schools have, were notorious for having high rates of um, tuberculosis and other sorts of diseases like the death rate was I think worse than going to World War One as a Canadian soldier you know you had a higher uh, chance of surviving World War One than you did of surviving a residential school and so that's what they are and that's how they were born and that's they became a massive problem because like from the outset I think that there was a duplicitous uh, shirking away of educational duties that the government just never fulfilled and well, the church a, tries to fill that. There was a lot of abuse in that school, sexual, physical abuse, Everything. and the children were taken away from their parents and if parents tried to stop that, the parents were put in jail. And yeah, the, the parents were put in jail, the their house would be seized, their, you know, just, it never ended. It was like a uh, and you got to remember, this is just one, one side, one facet of the colonial project that was going on at that time. It was also illegal for First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people to practice or talk their language. Couldn't do that in public. They couldn't uh, get lawyers to represent their issues. So the abuse that they were going through, it just never made it to court because it was illegal for them to go to court. If they wanted to get educated, they were stripped of their uh, First Nation status and put out, uh, you know, in society without protection from uh, Indian status. So, like, it just goes on and on and on and on. It's so complex, and mm -hmm. uh, that's how they got people off the land, you know. And that's how, you know, Canada exists where it is today. And the last residential school, actually, I think it only closed 1996, if I'm correct, if I remember that, or 97? Yes. Yeah. 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 Ninety six. I think it was Battleford or yeah. somewhere in Saskatchewan. Yeah. And so there's a lot of uh, long term, you know, after the aftermath of the of the abuse that happened certainly plays out today um, in homelessness and addiction, uh, post traumatic stress from all that, and uh, a society that never got to be with their own children even so yeah um, yeah there was a halting of of grieving of loss of just disconnection all the these uh, have created intergenerational trauma mm -hmm. within uh, m a lot of indigenous families that have had to endure this and you know and then there's the trauma of poverty the trauma of like just trying to find yourself after you know, you say your grandmother or grandfather went through one of these schools, it reverberates through the line. It just, mm -hmm. And it gets worse, actually, over time. It does not get better. So the dysfunction increases uh, as you go through time, unless someone puts a stop to it. Well, plus a society that hasn't had children in their, in their circles, then... Um, they don't know what it's like to live with children and then all of a sudden they get older children or come back and it there's so much damage and then they don't know how to help them and there wasn't really any good
programs out there. I mean, trust exactly. is a, trust is a very. I think that's where trust uh, for people who are vulnerable, homelessness or homeless. Um, that's a real big issue because they come into a, yeah. a medical clinic. We know that. We know it's a fact that they get undertreated. Their stereotypes, um, and so trust is really a big thing that is not there uh, for them for the from the medical profession. Yeah, I agree. I still don't trust a lot of doctors, and like here I am as a professional, uh, you know, professor and with a home, and I still have trouble with that. Like. That's so deeply ingrained in me from the street life, not to mm -hmm. trust, not to trust the doctors. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, you you've had a lot of visits, you know, and you're yeah, you're so many injuries. I mean, the the three and a half story fall uh, with your yeah. foot. Oh, one. Uh, I have one question to ask you. How is your foot uh, from that? It's not good. So I have to walk downstairs sideways, uh -huh. and there's a lot of scar tissue around the. It's like the, there's an L-shaped cut, and right at the corner, mm -hmm. there's like a, a lot of scar tissue, and I need to go through and have the hardware removed. I never had the hardware inside removed, oh, okay. and uh, I'm just terrified of going to the doctors mm -hmm. and having them open that up and take that out or. Yeah. It's terrifying. I don't know. How, and like, to my detriment, um, probably been in pain a lot longer than I need to be, mm -hmm. you know, but like, I remember what that was like, you know, and I can't, I can't just go and do that. You know, one of this, I've worked in emergency rooms and one of the stereotypes, the, the, there are many stereotypes and unfortunately stereotypes such as it, that Indigenous people have a, a high uh, a pain threshold, and or they're always drug seeking, and which has not been my experience whatsoever. In fact, um, I've known so many patients who do not want that, but those stereotypes persist. Um, do you have any insight into that as to why? Yeah, these stereotypes stem back to their, they come from contact, right? Like if you really trace them back through time, uh, they come from like earliest, um, there's the noble, so the epic savage, and then there's the cannibal savage, and they're two halves of the same stereotype uh, that Europeans projected onto native people to make sense of their world. It says more about the Europeans than it does about the indigenous people. And then these things have persisted the whole way, all the way up. Um, because it's, it's easier to attribute negative qualities onto somebody and say like, oh, they're that way because they're this, uh, without actually looking at like who that person is, what's their story, what's their history. Mm -hmm. What's their actual like circumstances that explains why they are the way they are, you know? Yeah. And then when you get that, then you can see, oh, hold on, this person's not actually a drug-seeking opioid addict. They're a high school student that got into an accident at the bus stop and they hurt their foot. And like anybody would be wanting some sort of pain relief at that time. It's not because they're native or mm -hmm. because they're indigenous. Uh, but it, that takes time and patience and trust to be able to build up that rapport and to find those stories out. And I don't think that a lot of doctors take the time to do that. And so they just resort to these older, easier stereotypes that just make their world easier to navigate, I guess. I don't know. This is probably not a good question but and or a hard question to answer. But how do you bring empathy back uh, it, in in that respect because i think sometimes in the medical profession empathy gets lost um, yeah people get burnt out right right people right. get burnt out you probably see the same dude show up in the emerge five times searching for oxys i don't know doing something that makes you think that way about indigenous peoples and then 
you just get burnt out and you start equating that to everyone so what i think i've asked is for doctors to see their patients as relatives oh yeah yeah that's it yeah it's simple I, simple I, how your mom comes in mm-hmm. you know how do you treat her do yeah. you treat her with hospital service uh in the hallway or do you find her you make sure that she finds a room and you build a uh, good rapport of trust and make sure that she's got a good patient advocate uh, that, that's looking up for her interests. All those things you would do for your family member. Do that for all of your patients. That, Simple. That's, actually, that's exactly what I tell my residents or medical students is that when you're asked, what would you do if this was my family member? You know, your wife, your son, your brother, your sister, your mother. And then the answers and the care will flow accordingly. So uh, I'm glad to hear you say that. That's a, that is good. Um, oh, thank you. You know, in 2014, they did, uh, I think they did a survey or some study, but there was like a quarter million um, uh, Canadians who are homeless. And a generation ago, Typically, the homeless, it was a single male who was homeless, and that demographic has changed now, where we see women, uh, youth, elderly, veterans, indigenous people, um, and immigrants. So there has been a shift in that respect. Can you talk about that? Sure. Yeah, the change that you're talking about really starts in like the early 90s in Canada when there's like a turning away in most major cities from zoning things for um, co-op housing, so for lower income housing. Mm -hmm. And the cities start rezoning these for condominium developments. And this happened all throughout the 90s while the homeless issue increased. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where it kind of started. That's really the genesis of it. And um, I think that there's a sickness in society now about the way that we look at housing. We've for a long time uh, become gluttons of property or we look at it as like a way uh, somewhere to park money, make money off of, you know, when really originally back in the eighties and seventies and prior to that house was a house to live in this conception of some place to park your money or flip or is a new modern phenomenon. And so I think that's the sickness that's driving homelessness is like our thirst for profit. A lot of those condominiums that got rezoned, are, they sit empty now mm-hmm. because people see them as a safe investment, right? You get a much higher return on two condominiums over the course of a year than you do over a bond uh, where your money's supposed to accrue. So these housing has become kind of like a bank for a lot of people to make money off of. And then beyond that, people have been buying houses and Airbnb has and apps of the sort have been used to rent out smaller spaces for more money to less people. And so all of these factors are at play, constricting the amount of housing, affordable housing that's been built for lower class people. And this has been going on now for 30 years. And so the end result is now it's not just men who are on the margins of society. Now it's single families, mothers, it's old people, it's veterans, it's like all strata of society that aren't making 60,000 and above. They're the ones who are falling into housing and homelessness now, you know, because they can't even afford a house. They change even the mortgage rules. You have to have 20% down and it's just, housing's unattainable for so many people now. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's a product of policy and the way that the city's formed, and we can change it. It just needs political will. Mm-hmm. No, I, I, I've certainly seen that over the years of practice. I've seen more single families and um, mothers, uh, 
even especially the elderly, they they can't afford where they're living or where they're living. It's they're living in squalor. It's uh, it's mm. not not a good environment at all. Um, yeah. J Jesse, I I could talk with you for a long time. I I just want to kind of turn and maybe I know you have to go. I want to turn just to some fun questions. Um, well, actually, I'm going to ask you one question, which is kind of a segue, I guess. What advice would you give to your younger 14-year-old self if you were to look back at your, your younger self? Is there any particular advice you would give with what you know now? Yeah. I would tell my young self to listen to the old man. That he does know what he's talking about. Which he's, old man? He's a prick. My grandpa. Okay. Yeah. Listen to him. He was a prick and he had lots of issues, but he ultimately did love you and he didn't he didn't mean to hurt you, I'd say that. You know? And then beyond that I would probably say if you're gonna use drugs, use them with people that you trust and don't go like uh exploring outside of those trusted networks. Uh, that's where I got in a lot of trouble. And I would also tell them to uh, get into school earlier, you know? I've missed half of my life. And if I would have gotten to school earlier, maybe I could have been a professor when I was 30, you know? Mm -hmm. And I'd, I'd have a boat now and my house would be paid off and I had two kids, right? So this is... Well, what would you... Would you say anything? I mean, not all doctors are bad. Not all healthcare professionals are bad. Like, I mean, w would would you say anything to help them try again? Because you know, the trouble with trust is once you've had trust broken, then you don't come back and you seek help. I mean, ultimately, you are where you're at because you did get help from. I mean, ultimately, we all are. You know, nobody succeeds in life yeah. on their own. Well, even the doctors that I did my surgery, even the doctors I interacted with, they were all good people. Mm -hmm. I just didn't listen to them because I was in my addiction. So I couldn't listen to them. So yeah. I would say, you know, to understand that um, people make up institutions. Yeah. And within institutions, there are good and bad people. Uh, there are people that try that are, are there for the right reasons and there's other people that are there because it's a paycheck just like any other job right. and so not to take it too seriously but then also to to recognize the humanity within healthcare and that there are people too and they're going to have a bad or a good day and uh to be mindful of that right because mm -hmm. uh, sometimes when you don't make a bond with someone on trust you feel because that person's treating you a certain way, and maybe they are. Maybe they're just having a bad day, though, mm -hmm. and you just caught them at a bad time, you know? And so I think that's really important to understand when we're talking about systems and institutions. I get asked this question about the police all the time. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's the same level of distrust that I have for police I have for doctors. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I always say. I have to remind myself, that they're people and that they're, you know, they're fallible and they, you know, they're part of an institution and that can all be changed with like, uh, good policy and, and protocol. Yeah. And if you don't find the right one on, on your first, second, third, don't stop is what I would say. You know, you know, there are yes. people that can help you. Uh, and that's crit critical like especially now like it's so hard to find a doctor oh my god yeah i spent years trying to find one and so like as a homeless person who's transient back in the day or even now i can't even imagine how hard it is you know i can't even it it's just true it uh it is a it is difficult i mean there's not enough healthcare professionals around uh, and there's so much mm -hmm. need um, that's part of the problem with, he with so many healthcare professionals. They're getting burnt out, and yeah. um, we do need to fix that. Um, yeah. I'd like to ask you: Do you ha are you reading anything currently right now? Any book? 
or have you read one? Uh, so, yeah, let me just pull my yeah. massive pile of books here. Um, this book is uh, picking up the it's, pieces. It's picking up the pieces by Carrie Newman, mm -hmm. who's a master carver on the West Coast, and Chris Christy Hudson. It's about residential school memories and the making of the witness blanket. So this is, he's a master carver and he took pieces from all the residential schools mm -hmm. and all the different stories and embedded them in this long uh, art installation. And this is an amazing, amazing, amazing book that's doing really good work. I think even some of the proceeds go to support uh, the remembrance of Indigenous uh, experiences in residential schools. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, yeah, yeah. What it's a little do? heavy, but I'm sure. What, 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 like, now you're a professor, you, you know, you're teaching, you're doing a lot of uh, book tours. Now it's become virtual book tours. And um, what do you do for fun? What, do you, what are your hobbies? My f hobby f for fun is to play with my cat, number one. She's always around. And I tease her until she she meows and scratches me. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I go for long walks with the wife. We're doing IVF and we're trying to train and get our physical health up. Yeah, IVF is in vitro us. fertilization, just so anybody. Yeah. yeah. And congratulations. Yeah, we need there. the energy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And then I go to the beach a lot. I go yeah. to the beach a lot these days, yeah. So I'm, between all that, I'm, I'm relaxed and that's what I do. That's yeah. wonderful. One little final question. Um, if you were to put a saying on a billboard on a mat big highway for the world to see, what would you write on that billboard? If think can... of the next person. Think of the next person. Think That's of it. the next person. Okay. That's wonderful. Yeah. That, that comes from my grandfather. He used to say that. Because oh. we used to pee. Thank you, Lala. It's been wonderful. Thank you. And thank you, all listeners. It's been wonderful. What are you doing this? You, you're not thinking of the next person. And they told me that one time and it stuck and I stopped being on the toilet because I think of the next person. And I do that with everything I do now in life. That you know, I don't want to leave being on the toilet for anybody. So <laughs> I'm going to tell that to my nine-year-old son when he does that. So that's, that's wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let me know how it goes. <laughs> um, do you have uh, any ask of the audience? I mean, I know that I want to say to the audience that I'm going to be giving a few books away from from the ashes. Everybody should read this book. But as a, you send an email, get in touch with me, and uh, I will be gifting you some book uh, books from uh, Jesse Tissel's book. I think everybody should read it. But do you have an, an ask uh, from the audience, uh, Jesse? Yeah, just to support your local shelter, your mm -hmm. local and food bank, and like try to like help them in a good way. I don't know. I know times are tough for everybody, but maybe just maybe do something pro bono. I know it's in a lot of your listeners' power, mm -hmm. or just donate some of your time. Uh, to helping one of these orgs because like all hands on deck yeah. with these kind of orgs and it helps so what's the best way people can get a hold of you if they want to reach out to you uh, they can follow me at, at Mitchif Man M-I-C-H Man M-A-N on Twitter or Instagram or you can follow me at Jesse Thistle uh on my uh, author page on um, um, Facebook. Yeah, that's uh, the other place. Or you can come to York University and see me in the humanities department. That's fantastic. Jesse, yeah. thank you so much for taking the time today and talking with me. And uh, thank you for writing the book. And uh, good luck with everything. And we will be in touch again. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lala. It's been wonderful. Thank you. And thank you, all listeners. It's been wonderful. Thank you.
I hope all of you are having a great summer. Just a quick note, I'm going to be taking a couple weeks off at the end of August to, to be with my family as we head into the school year. And I will see you again in September. Have a great summer.